Trades are awesome, right? I mean, half of this channel is talking about trades. We as fans like to speculate on them. We love when there's a lot of them. The bigger name, the better. So today, I wanted to talk about, because trades are one of my favorite things, one of my favorite trades of all time. And it's this trade that I actually believe to be both the best and worst trade at the same time, depending on whose perspective you're looking at. So let's talk about, just because I'm gonna title it negatively because negativity gets better views, the worst trade of all time. Let's get into it. Before I continue on with this video, if you end up enjoying it, then please be sure to subscribe to the channel if you enjoy the content and you're gonna wanna see more of it. It only makes sense that you subscribe and of course I want you to do it because it means more people returning to my content, means more views, means more money, means I get to retire earlier. Also drop a like on this video, it only takes one second and it makes a massive difference in how it performs in the YouTube algorithm. One of the reasons why trades are one of my favorite things about the NBA and basketball is kind of the politics and the business stuff that goes on behind the scenes. It's just interesting, the very concept of trading players or picks and assets and all that stuff. A huge part of the bureaucratic landscape of the NBA is trading players. And the reason that's interesting to me is like, seeing people interpret and evaluate talent and seeing whether or not they do that correctly in the moment and especially, especially over time. Anytime a player is traded, what they are traded for is subsequently deemed as that player's value. And it's interesting to see years later if what was deemed that player's value actually ends up being that player's value or if it was a miscalculation. Every single trade is a hypothetical until we see it play out. Like, Technically, the Ben Simmons side of the James Harden trade is still a hypothetical because we still haven't seen him play in Brooklyn, so we still don't have a full scope of that trade. But looking at every meticulous step of a move and really seeing like if somebody got screwed or not, it's just fun as hell to me. Something that I love to do is to go and find old trades and then look down the trail of what happened as a result of it. The butterfly effect of one move. The longer the trail, the better, especially if there is a treat at the end. And by a treat, I mean some player ends up on some team because of a move that happened like eight years ago and that player is really fucking good. One of the most prominent talking points involving trades is the idea of like someone getting screwed over in a trade or someone being fleeced. As soon as a trade happens now, there's immediate conversation about who won the trade. Even if a trade doesn't necessarily have a strong winner or loser, it's still important to us as NBA fans to declare winners and losers. Cause I mean, a lot of us are competitive in nature, that's why we're drawn to sports. Aw oh, man, the Knicks got absolutely fleeced in that trade. Just as an example, you know, the Knicks are a good team to choose for that. So all of this babbling aside that was like, that definitely felt like it took too long. What I'm trying to set up here is the biggest fleece in NBA history. And this fleece stemmed from a trade that seemed small at the time, that seemed like a smart trade at the time, and then years later ended up biting a team in the ass. Let me take you back to the year 1976. If copyright wasn't an issue, I'd play Fortunate Son over this. The Wests and Wilt Lakers had come to an end as they both retired. However, there was a shooting guard in the middle of his prime still on the team's roster. This two guard was a multiple time all-star by the name of Gail Goodrich. Goodrich was quite, well, good. However, he was not good enough to be a franchise cornerstone going forward after the retirement of those two, and he was just going to hold them in perpetual mediocrity. So with a rebuilding Lakers team, which is a team that would also go on to get Kareem frickin' Abdul-Jabbar relatively soon, but they were trying to be bad, and Gale had to be shipped out. And in return, they got back two first round picks. So Gale was gone to the Jazz. It's actually a little bit more complicated than two first round picks. There was a bunch of swaps going on there, but ultimately 
some first round picks got moved for Gale that the Lakers would end up having possession of later. That's the important part. The Jazz, to be fair, were primed to trade for someone like Gale. They had the upside to trade for established talent. The Jazz were a new franchise and actually in New Orleans at the time, though they were in Utah by 1979, and they were ready to break out of mediocrity with a star player in Gale Goodrich. They were really banking on him being what turned that franchise around. However, unfortunately for Gale and the Jazz, and very fortunately for the Lakers, Gale really slowed down the moment that he wasn't in a Lakers jersey. His production was still passable, though not at a star level, and worse than that, he could not stay on the floor. His 30s caught up to him as soon as he put on a Jazz jersey, and as a result, he only averaged 60 games per season for three seasons with the team. And then he would retire at the age of 35. His peak statistically in New Orleans was in his second season where he would average just 16 points and five assists. Meanwhile, those Lakers picks that they had, well, one of them was Freeman Williams, who would actually be a pretty damn decent NBA player but the Lakers would trade him but the other pick well it ended up being the number one pick in the 1979 draft which if you did not know was the draft that had Irvin Magic Johnson in it and just to add to all of this is the thing that the Lakers also had at this point was Kareem Abdul-Jabbar who was at this point by far and away the best player in the league. So this is like the 2004 Pistons having the number two pick kind of what the fuck, but honestly even more severe than that considering the dynasty that would follow. How does a team this talented get a pick that high? Kareem was the best player in basketball at that time. He really had just had no competition. But how does a team that good get that pick? Well, they do so through a dumbass trade. So suddenly the Lakers are able to put together one of the greatest duos in NBA history. And in terms of accolades, the most accomplished duo ever. There's no pair of two players with a better combined resume than those two guys. They were able to do that because the Jazz desperately wanted some sort of star talent on the team and Gail Goodrich drastically failed them. Meanwhile, the Jazz end up missing on a player that many considered the GOAT at least at one point. Again, in exchange for just a couple of games out of a 35-year-old Gail Goodrich. Yeesh. But don't worry, Utah Jazz fans. Like, you have something to be positive like Magic about. I mean, it's not like things are going poorly now when you're about to enter a rebuild or anything. Oh yeah, no. Um, sucks to suck, I guess. <laughs> So yeah, that was the greatest and worst trade of all time. The Lakers did a masterful job of building with their star power and the Jazz gave away a generational player and a top five player of all time in exchange for a couple of games out of a really old shooting guard. Not the best look in the world. But anyways, shout out to Rudy for editing this video. That was the end of this video. Please be sure to like and subscribe for NBA content like this and hear the outro music.